Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Hoover Institution and our project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region and the Stanford Internet Observatory, it is a pleasure to welcome you to today's program to discuss an excellent report that sheds fresh light and understanding on how the Chinese Communist Party uses sophisticated influence operations to advance its narratives and generate support for, or at least blunt opposition to, its policies and actions. The report focuses on three case studies, the 2019 Hong Kong protests, the 2020 Taiwan presidential election, and the COVID-19 pandemic. This report arrives just in time because the Chinese Communist Party has become more aggressive during the twin crises of the global pandemic and the economic recession associated with it. In his speech on Asia's community of common destiny in 2015, Chinese President Xi Jinping summarized China's conception of win-win relations in Asia and the world. We all know now that what Chinese leaders really have in mind is to win twice and leave other nations in positions of relative disadvantage. Consider that in the midst of the global pandemic, the People's Liberation Army and the Ministry of State Security have conducted cyber attacks against hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, and medical research facilities developing COVID-19 therapies and vaccines triumphing in the race for a vaccine would help China reinforce the narrative that its authoritarian mercantilist system is superior to our democratic free market systems. As this report points out, the party is gravely concerned about the COVID-19 related risk to its reputation and has aligned overt and covert efforts to reduce that risk and chalk up the pandemic as a win-win. This report arrives just in time because having given COVID-19 to the world through its deliberate cover-up of the initial outbreak, the CCP then engaged in heavy-handed wolf warrior diplomacy. China's diplomats and agents have used disinformation not only to obscure its responsibility for the pandemic, but also to portray European and American responses to the crisis as indicative of the ineptitude, corruption, and incompetence of democracies. They, of, co of course, cannot do that with Taiwan because it handled the pandemic brilliantly, despite having been excluded from the World Health Organization as part of China's effort to subvert that organization. This report arrives just in time because the party is intent on shaping global narratives to provide cover for aggression from Hong Kong to the South China Sea, to the East China Sea, to its Himalayan border with India, to Taiwan, which has received continuous focused attention from the party beyond the failed effort to influence the election, which is detailed in this report. That attention extended beyond the information sphere as the PLA, People's Liberation Army, have conducted nighttime drills in the Taiwan Strait and its fighter and bomber aircraft have conducted threatening overflights. Recently, the PLA chief of the Joint Staff Department, Li Zhuhang Chung, threatened to resolutely smash any separatist plots or actions. This report arrives just in time because as I read section three, I thought about the role that Chinese domestic propaganda could play in precipitating an international crisis. It was of course, Joseph Go Goebbels, Goebbels uh, the propaganda minister of Nazi Germany, who called radio the most important instrument of mass influence that exists anywhere. This report got me thinking about how radio broadcasts incited mass murders of the Tutsi minority during the 1994 Rwandan genocide, during which 800,000 people were murdered in 100 days, or the role that Facebook messaging played in jump-starting mass atrocities against the Rohingya in Myanmar in 2016. What if PLA commanders believe the propaganda that touts the CCP's achievements, maligns its enemies, 
and makes its ascent appear inexorable, such that they not only amplify the party's chauvinistic rhetoric, but also try to make good on it through aggressive action. So thank you and congratulations to the authors who make up our all-star panel for this timely and important report. I'm H.R. McMaster and it's a, a privilege to introduce th this highly talented team. Renee DeResta is the research manager at the Stanford Information Observatory, or SIO. Much of her work focuses on state-sponsored disinformation and propaganda. She has investigated Russian interference in the 2016 election. And one of the many valuable aspects of this report is the comparative analysis of how China and Russia do information operations. Carly Miller is a social science researcher at the SIO where she monitored the lead up to the Taiwanese 2020 election, analyzed state-backed information operations on Twitter, and published resources on cyber attribution. Vanessa Moulter is a research assistant at SIO and a master in international policy candidate at Stanford. She has studied and published on the Taiwanese social media environment and Chinese state media narratives on COVID-19. John Pomfret is former Beijing bureau chief for the Washington Post and author of the award-winning book, The Beautiful Country and the Middle Kingdom, America and China from 1776 to the Present. Hey, I think everybody should read that book. I, I loved every page in it and, and the, just the, the, the continuities in the American experience over time is quite, is quite striking. Glenn Tifford is a historian of, of modern China and a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution where he directs its project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region and on China's global sharp power. These are great projects that are already having important impacts and are building momentum. So I thought I might paraphrase, paraphrase selectively from Xi Jinping and his thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics that this is a study that really does seek truth from facts, combines historical perspective with a series of major ideas, and thereby achieves a historic leap in the field of understanding how the Chinese Communist Party tries to shape global narratives and conceal the pernicious agenda behind its effort to build a community with a shared future for humanity, a future that would leave the world less free, less secure, and less prosperous. So we'll begin with Glenn, and then each panelist will present key points for about five minutes each. Please send your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and I'll present as many of those questions to the panelists after their presentations. Over to you, Glenn. Thanks so much, HR. That was a wonderfully generous introduction. Uh, on behalf of the Hoover Institution's project on Taiwan and the Indo-Pacific region, which is an initiative sponsored by the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office that promotes research, teaching, and public understanding about Taiwan, I want to say that it's been a great pleasure joining forces with our colleagues at the Stanford Internet Observatory to produce this report. Our goal was to draw on the complementary skill sets that the two teams had to offer, and I'm very pleased with how that turned out. Uh, I'm going to lay out some of the framing for the report and a bit of background, and my co-authors will then follow with specific coverage of our findings. To begin with, we set out to explore the basic question, how do state actors with full spectrum propaganda capabilities put them to use in modern day information operations? That is a broader framing than you'll find in many reports in this problem space, particularly those with a social media focus. And we approached it that way because we felt that many discussions about digital disinformation were drawn far too narrowly, tended to treat social media in isolation and relied too much on breathless statements that could benefit from deeper empirical scrutiny. And so we try to do just that, give the deeper empirical scrutiny. Because China's activities are widely discussed but underanalyzed, we focused on three timely case studies, the Taiwan elections in 2020, the Hong Kong protests, and COVID-19, as HR duly noted. Let me put forward five basic propositions to get us started. Number one, we need to understand information operations holistically, 
particularly among countries like Russia and China that have full spectrum capabilities and the potential to use them in an integrated, mutually reinforcing way. We in this report show how social media disinformation often complements and is interwoven with disinformation operations in more traditional media, such as print, in diplomatic posturing, in covert human operations, and in well-funded strategic campaigns to reshape the global media environment. The best players bring to the table a multi-dimensional toolkit, and we have to analyze it and combat it that way. Otherwise, it's like a parable of it's like a parable of sightless people feeling an elephant. Each only grasps a part of the problem. Let me mention an example from present-day Sweden that is discussed in more depth in the report. In January 2019, the then ambassador from Sweden to China um, held a secret meeting in Stockholm with the daughter of an imprisoned Chinese dissident and two business people. Ostensibly, the meeting was to offer employment opportunities and financial opportunities to the daughter of this imprisoned dissident. Uh, on the agenda, however, as the discussions unfolded, was uh, they dangled these inducements to her essentially to get her agreement to end her very, very public campaign championing her father's cause. Uh, and unfortunately, this was part of a united front operation in which non-attributable actors working on behalf of the Chinese government had ingratiated themselves with the, with the Swedish ambassador to China and together joined forces to try to silence one of the most vocal international critics of the Chinese regime. Ultimately, it was not successful and the Swedish government in fact dismissed their ambassador over the incident and then chose to prosecute her for arbitrary conduct in negotiating with a foreign power. Ultimately, she was acquitted in part because prosecutors could not overcome the problem of attribution intrinsic to this type of operation. That was that the businessmen who were representing China's interests could not be tied unambiguously to China. This is a very important dimension of how China operates to try to control the information space in non-attributable ways, running human information to shut down vocal critics who can challenge its larger information strategies. Proposition number two, digital disinformation campaigns can use new technologies and they do, but the strategic thinking, psychology and ambitions behind them are age old. China and Russia have a century or more of experience in analog media and running human operations and agents of influence. And that remains highly relevant today and can teach us. The report discusses an example from the Korean War. Uh, which I'll just quickly spotlight in a moment. In 1952, the young Chinese government in the midst of the Korean War accused the United States of orchestrating a germ warfare campaign against it, which in their words was responsible for outbreaks of bubonic plague and anthrax uh, in parts of China and North Korea. There was a large international campaign mobilized by China and its socialist allies to put this message up front, and they organized a delegation of left-leaning and pacifist Western sympathizers to tour China as a fact-finding commission and then publicize this information and write it up in Western media. This very traditional style of human operations was also is, is also very sort of relevant today in the context of COVID-19. Proposition number three, we need to know something about the states and ideologies behind these information operations, particularly China, which has an immense bureaucracy devoted to controlling information. And our report unpacks that with respect to the Central Propaganda Department and the United Front, which for people who don't study China deeply are two organs that are very difficult to wrap their minds around because no one else in the world has anything like them. Proposition number four, Overt and covert information operations often run in tandem and are complementary. So do operations in traditional and new media, even if clear attribution is challenging. To use another metaphor, it's like an iceberg. There is the part you see above the water, and then there is so much more that lies in the murky depths, but it is all connected. And proposition number five, China is often lumped together with China, which is better studied. And granted, both do sophisticated information operations, but they do them differently. One of the key takeaways in our report is that in the Chinese case studies that we examine, quantity is clearly trumping quality. China is trying hard, but it's just not very good at this. It's generating a lot of sparks, but little fire. Russia is orders of magnitude better at connecting with its intended audiences. 
Having said that, we need to keep an eye on China, continue studying it because it will get better. It is constantly evolving, for example, by moving into other platforms such as YouTube. And with that, let me hand it over to my colleague, John Pomfret, who will take you through the traditional media dimensions of our report. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thanks to HR and also to Glenn for their work on the report and to the SIO team. I've learned a lot from, from all of you. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the traditional media space in China. China went through a sort of golden era of traditional media in the late 1990s with the advent of uh, intensified economic reforms, also the internet coming to China. The media landscape really changed in China for several years where you had media, newspapers in Guangdong, magazines in Beijing, who were engaged in really pushing the envelope of what was permissible to be reported in a communist country. So you had a series of investigative reports on the AIDS crisis in several provinces in China, corruption, and the media even went so far as to, to touch on police brutality, which was a very sensitive issue as one could imagine in, 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 in a one-party state. That period, that sort of copper era, if you will, or bronze era of Chinese internet and, and reporting freedom is over. It basically started to end in the 2000s as a variety of Chinese bureaucracies, the Ministry of Propaganda, the State, Inf State Council Information Offices reasserted control over the somewhat fractious media. They replaced liberal ed editors and newspapers. Some uh, publishers were thrown into jail. And the media was, to use a Chinese expression, pretty much completely harmonized to reflect the interests and the beliefs and the values and the positions of the Chinese Communist Party. And now in China, you have a situation where on a routine basis, not, it's not unusual, but on a routine basis, the front pages of newspapers across China are often absolutely 100% identical. You saw this on October 26, 2017, with the inauguration of Xi Jinping's second term as the Communist Party chief. All the newspapers, of, of, of all the front pages of 22 newspapers in China were the same. But you also saw this during, in September of 2018 during the China-Africa summit. The Chinese uh, propaganda ministry has also ordered the government to begin blocking websites of Western news agencies, which were a relatively free source of information to many Chinese. This intensified after 2012, when the New York Times and the Bloomberg News Agency published individual reports about the, the, the wealth of Chinese Communist Party families. Uh, Wen Jiabao, in the case of the New York Times, who was then premier of China, and Xi Jinping, who was the, is, is, is the current party chief. So Xi Jinping really has pushed China and the Chinese media to, to basically directly serve the interests of the party. Previously, there was this idea that the, the Chinese media could serve the interests of China. But now, under Xi Jinping's uh, control, the, part of the, the media has been really pushed to, to reflect the interests only of the Chinese Communist Party and to, as Xi Jinping said, better tell China's story. Now, this increased control domestically has also been paralleled by a push by the Chinese uh, media organizations to control the narrative, uh, narrative about China globally as well. And so the party has invested billions of dollars into creating a whole infrastructure of overseas media. So today, the Xinhua News Agency rivals the Reuters News Agency as the biggest news agency in the world. Uh, it has actually seven bureaus in the United States. Actually, now it has six bureaus in the United States with the closure of the Houston consulate because the Xinhua has a policy of only having bureaus in the cities where China has consulates. Again, uh, illustrating the parallel interests of both the Chinese diplomacy and its state-run media. China Global Television has a presence all over the world. Its hub in Washington, D.C. is not simply an American hub, but it's a hub for all of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, now, there's also Chinese China Daily, of course, with its ubiqu ubiquitous advertising inserts into, in the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. In addition to a push to try to push China's narrative in the English speaking and foreign language speaking space, there's also been a parallel push to really control the narrative in the Chinese language speaking community overseas. So 30 years ago, the Chinese language media space in the United States, Australia, and other parts of the world was populated by a variety of political perspectives. Today, it too has increasingly been harmonized to reflect Beijing's values. 
the overseas Chinese uh, the overseas Chinese Affairs Office, which used to be under the State Council, has been involved in a variety of activities, including setting up foreign publications, as it has in the United States, but also um, sub subtly subsidizing these publications, giving support and training to journalists, and also doing things like, for example, underneath the uh, Overseas Chinese Affairs Office, there's something called the China News Service, and that news service offers pro-Beijing newspapers across the world a mock-up system where in real time they will lay out and give you total content for your international news page in your uh, pro-Beijing Chinese language newspaper. It's a real service, it takes a lot of money, but they do it. So back, one, back, to, back to Glenn's point, when it comes to Chinese language operations, China has been far more successful in controlling the narrative than it has when it's, when it's engaged in foreign language uh, uh, reporting. So China Global Television has very limited uh, viewership in the United States, but Chinese language publications pretty much are pro, all pro-Beijing in this country and dominate the narrative within the Chinese language speaking community. So with that, I'll pass it over to my next colleague. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, I will be covering China's influence operations uh, during the 2020 elections in Taiwan. So our case studies looked at the full spectrum of overt and covert tactics um, that Glenn and John uh, touched on. Um, and this spans a range of attributable to dark media properties, um, as well as overt to inauthentic behavior on social media. So specifically um, with Taiwan, um, SAO has previously written a series of blog posts monitoring the lead up to the election and some of the analysis that we did for this case study was built off that initial research. Overall, we and other researchers observed both overt and covert tactics uh, leading up to the 2020 election, um, including traditional media propaganda, uh, content farms with potential and unattributable mainland connections, dubious YouTube channels, and fake Twitter accounts. Uh, for this case study, I'm going to be focusing on one of the overt tactics, which is aligned messaging between Chinese state media and Beijing friendly Taiwanese media and overt, uh, sorry, covert tactics, uh, the creation of fake Twitter accounts. So both of these overt and covert tactics were leveraged to address claims raised by the self-declared spy, uh, which broke in November 2019. The alleged Chinese spy Wang Lichang claimed to have meddled in Taiwan's 2018 local elections to boost support uh, for then mayoral candidate Hong Guyu, who later won the election in 2018. Now, the story is important for two reasons. The first is that after winning the 2018 election, Hong Guyu went to run for president um, as Beijing's preferred candidate. Now, the second reason the story is important is that it seemed to confirm for many people suspicions that Beijing had interfered in the 2018 election um, and that it heightened people's fears that he would do the same, uh, sorry, Beijing would do the same uh, in the 2020 election. Now this story was dominating the news cycle in Taiwan after it broke. Um, among Taiwan's four major media outlets, it became clear that um, while other outlets debated Wang's claims, uh, two outlets, China Times and United Daily News, a more KMT blue friendly uh, media outlet, were publishing articles that aimed to discredit the spy and his claims. Um, so to clarify what we mean by Beijing friendly uh, with re regards to China Times, um, be beginning in July uh, 2019, the Financial Times reported that China Times receives editorial instructions from Taiwan Affairs Office, which John mentioned before, uh, which is a body of the Chinese government. So China Times portrayal of the spy was very similar uh, to his portrayal in Chinese state media. Um, on this side, you can see that both outlets frame the story as a spy farce. Um, another common framing that we saw was that the spy's claims couldn't be true because he wasn't old enough to be privy to the information to manipulate an election. So while SIO couldn't independently confirm that China Times receives editorial direction um, from China, the Chinese government, um, our observations of the outlet's coverage during the spy controversy was that it served as a valuable asset in disseminating PRC preferred messages in Taiwan. 
Now, an example of this um, was the coverage of an exclusive video released by China's Global Times, which allegedly showed the spy appearing in front of court in 2016 on fraud charges. So on Facebook, Chinese state media articles were not getting as much reach when compared to China Times and United Daily News articles, uh, which were shared in pro Hangulu fan pages. Um, and in fact, this coverage um, in Chinese state media um, was able to be to penetrate uh, Taiwanese communities online through these Taiwanese publications. So in addition to traditional media propaganda, China has also deployed covert tactics uh, to discredit the spy. So in June 2020, Twitter released a data set of over 23,000 accounts, um, suspended accounts linked to the PRC that SAO um, was able to analyze. And not only 1% of these tweets mentioned Taiwanese content. Um, and this could be because uh, Twitter is not as uh, prevalent in Taiwan as it is in Hong Kong, which was another target of the campaign. Um, but what is significant about this small data set is that half of the tweets um, of Taiwan related content um, were concentrated at the end of November 2019, which you can see on the screen, um, the timeline of the tweets. Um, and this is in a two day period uh, when the story of the spy was unfolding. Um, and so one of the examples of the tweets that we analyzed um, shows that the story was spun in a way um, that made it seem that Tsai Ing Wen uh, had constructed this campaign um, to hurt Kong Liu and um, that she was a co-conspirator in all this. Now it's important to note here that this was the only attributed activity on social media to China. Um, China did not appear to have leveraged fake accounts on popular platforms such as Facebook that many people had anticipated. Um, so to conclude, one takeaway here that is important is that China seemed to spend more time leveraging um, traditional narrative uh, propaganda against Taiwan um, rather than covertly on social media. Um, and this could be because of the backlash China received after the Hong Kong protests um, and its covert activity directed there. Um, but what is important about this covert activity is that it uh, reinforces our understanding that China will concentrate its efforts and capabilities when there is an event that threatens its global image, uh, such as the spy story. And now I'll pass it along to my, uh, co uh, my colleague, Vanessa. So um, I'll be talking a bit about our second case study, COVID-19. And I wanted to start by giving some key takeaways on China's tactics and narratives first, and then I'll dive into some of these later and show some examples. So what we saw in this case overall was that China deployed tactics across the spectrum of overt and covert, including state media, diplomats and their social media presence, and covert accounts, for example, on Twitter. An important part of controlling the narrative was censorship of individuals and information channels within China. So for example, whistleblowers were detained, they were interrogated, or they disappeared, and some of them are still missing today, over five months later. And at the same time, journalists from foreign media, including from the New York Times and the Washington Post, were expelled from China. And this censorship of domestic information channels, together with expulsions of foreign media, allowed China to control the narrative about the outbreak within China. Another tactic that we observed was that China, Chinese state media that are quite present on non-Chinese social media um, used targeted Facebook ads to reach audiences all around the world and to in that way spread the preferred CCP narrative. And I'll show two examples of, of that in a minute. Another interesting behavior that played out openly on social media, especially on Twitter, was that Chinese diplomats and embassies engaged in the wolf warrior diplomacy that was mentioned before, meaning that they criticize other governments pretty harshly, they praise the CCP and spread CCP narratives, including on whether the coronavirus had originated in China or not. And then the last thing I'd like to highlight before showing um, examples of these tactics was that when we analyzed a data set of covert Twitter accounts that were attributed to the Chinese government, what we saw was that the narratives they were pushing were pretty similar to those we saw openly promoted on Chinese state media. 
So here are two examples of Facebook ads that Chinese state media pages were running back in March. And you can see how both of them promote CCP talking points on the pandemic. The one on the left criticizes President Trump for his remarks on the virus. And it reads, the fight against the coronavirus needs science, not stigma. And criticizing the pandemic response by other countries, especially by the US, was a pretty common narrative we saw across all Chinese influence channels. And then the one on the right, on the other hand, praises Xi Jinping for what it says was leading the battle against the outbreak. So these are examples of how Chinese state media used Facebook to spread preferred CCP narratives. This example is to the point of Chinese diplomats and embassies engaging in shaping the narrative on COVID-19. And this is a screenshot of a tweet by Zhao Lijian. So for those of you who may not know him, Zhao got quite a bit of attention last year while he was still serving in the Chinese embassy in Pakistan because he was tweeting and often criticizing the United States. And then he also got in a Twitter dispute with Susan Rice, the former US National Security Advisor in July of last year and then a month later, he was promoted to his current position, which is deputy director of the information department within the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And his Twitter account is pretty popular now with almost 750,000 followers. And in this tweet that he shared back in March, he was saying that it might be the US Army who brought the epidemic to Wuhan. And he claimed that the US owed an explanation. And we actually track this conspiracy theory about US Army involvement in separate research at the Internet Observatory and we evidence of it being shared as early as late January. So this wasn't a novel idea that he was spreading per se, but what Zhao did was elevated to significant attention and that caused quite a bit of backlash from American policymakers and analysts. So this tweet is an example of uh, Chinese diplomats and embassies going on Twitter with their official accounts uh, criticizing other governments and amplifying the CCP's preferred narratives. And then the last example I'd like to show is an image that was shared by covert Chinese Twitter accounts. So this image was shared by one of the over 23,000 accounts that Twitter removed about a month ago and attributed to the Chinese government. And on the image, you can see all these arms coming out of Wuhan pointing at what looks like a few very scared viruses and the image says, Wuhan must win, China must win, one mind, unity, everybody supports it. So again, the narratives we saw in this covert activity mirrored that that was shared through over channels, praising the government, calling on Chinese unity, and criticizing others in the context of COVID-19, including the American government, Taiwan, and Hong Kong protesters. And this tweet is an example of that kind of calling on Chinese unity and saying that Wuhan and China must win. And with that, I hand it over to Renee to put these findings in a broader context. Thank you. And thanks to uh, all of my colleagues who have uh, framed their, their report. So I'd like to talk a little bit about um, how this is a framework that we have used with other actors as we study information at SIO. Uh, the way in which we've chosen to identify and study information operations is holistically. We do believe that separating out social media and media is no longer a distinction that we can really, um, that, that is supportable at this point. So when we think about broadcast media and access that sophisticated state actors have, um, what we see is that the broadcast media actually often has a social media presence as well. And this is particularly true for China which has massive state media presence on Facebook, despite the fact that Facebook is banned within China. Uh, but it's also something that we see other sophisticated state actors doing. So Iran, uh, Russia are both two examples where there is a state media presence on social media as well. So this is yet another distribution channel. And what that means is when we consider these operations holistically, what we're looking at is the way in which the narrative is uh, broadcast across all the channels at their disposal, both overt and covert, in service to repetition, uh, in service to persuasion, in service to distraction. The specifics of the operation may vary, but the idea that the rules of the game are sort of set by the information architecture of the time is how we look at this uh, at SIO. 
So we've done rather extensive work on Russia in the past, uh, including for the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. We've looked at both how the Internet Research Agency operated in Russia, which is the sort of very uh, covert, mimetic, um, social media first operation, and how they leveraged that capability in conjunction with the activities that the GRU were doing. So for example, narrative propaganda laundered through uh, a range of completely unattributed and partially unattributed uh, friendly blogs. And so we look at that in the context of China as well. And what we begin to see is this spectrum of overt to covert that exists both in the broadcast and print space, as well as in the social media space. And so when you consider the operation, when you consider the case study, uh, it's important to look at it in its entirety in all of the places that uh, the actor has at its, at its disposal. So when we talk about these pages, particularly uh, Chinese state media on Facebook, uh, many of them have over 80 million followers. Some of the largest have over 100 million followers. And so they use things like Facebook ads to increase their reach, uh, to push out stories that they're interested in disseminating to larger audiences. And that is a thing where, again, we're seeing uh, state media adopt a particular uh, point of view, put out a, a, an overt attributable point of view on social media. Sorry, my daughter's here. Thanks. Um, the way that that works, however, oh, go, go, go. <laughs> um, is that the, the commonalities that we see between Russia and China are this development of uh, sophisticated state media presences with very large audiences that they can leverage at their disposal. And then in addition, this incorporation of covert social tactics. So the message is always received by the uh, most reliable or most relatable messenger. And that's how that, uh, that dynamic begins to take shape. What we've seen though, is that Russia's engagement, even though China's audiences are larger, even though China may be producing uh, more bots, you know, 100,000, 150,000 Twitter accounts, uh, their engagement is still very low compared to what Russia has been able to achieve. And so when we look comparatively between China and Russia, we see a commitment to the development of the strategy. We see the strategy being leveraged now three or four different occasions, three or four different topics. But what we don't see is that same commitment to uh, early planned adoption in which the personas are developed in advance and they, res they create content and topics uh, that are relevant to the target audience. So there's a lack of sophistication. As Glenn put it, there's an emphasis on quantity over quality. And that's one of the very interesting dynamics in the difference between how China and Russia are operating in the space. The other thing that remains significantly different uh, is that while Russia in certain parts of the world has an interest in creating a positive perception of Russia, we see this particularly in things like RT Latin America, where they're, uh, they're very interested in creating a particular perception of their own uh, magnanimity with the people that they are reaching out to. Uh, what we also see is China has that interest more broadly and Russia is much more interested in creating chaos. And so the dynamic is distinctly different. So on social media, you'll see Russian accounts creating uh, personas that are operating on both sides of an issue Whereas what you'll see from China is accounts that are created to emphasize and advance a positive perception of China. So that's a, a distinct difference, largely stemming from the fact that the strategic objective is fundamentally different. So in the case studies in the report, uh, we describe the deployment of this full spectrum of technologically enabled propaganda. So there's the overt attributable state media, there's the gray media content farms, there's the covert social media persona accounts. Um, we see this as, as Glenn uh, alluded to at the start, a modern update, a modern technologically enhanced update of very, very old strategic uh, principles. So I think where we are going with this research, particularly at SIO, is we're continuing to look at how state actors learn, iterate, and adapt, particularly as they occasionally lose accounts to takedowns. Uh, we're looking at how 
tactics honed in these uh, intensely contested domains that are of strategic relevance to China, such as Taiwan, Hong Kong, and COVID-19, uh, are potentially likely to be applied to other issues and regions of the world. We saw Russia begin to operate in very near-term theater, you know, working on uh, narratives around MH17, around the annexation of Crimea, things that were very directly of interest to Russia and its near-term, uh, sorry, near sphere of influence. And then what we see is uh, with a lot of, kind of um, the beginnings of, of more extensive operations uh, six months to a year after those operations began, including the ones targeting the United States. So we think that keeping abreast of the landscape, uh, tactical, structural, how state actors are using it, is critical towards understanding information operations uh, and ensuring our ability to detect and mitigate them as they continue to evolve. I think we're all looking forward to taking questions now. Great job, panel. Let's give a virtual round of applause to everybody. <laughs> and uh, I'm so sorry you can't, uh, you, you can't, you can't hear it. So, uh, so a gr great discussion. Thank you so much. We have we have lots and lots of questions, more than we're gonna have time to. So I'll, I'll try to compress some of these. So a lot of questions of, about about what impact uh, chi Chinese. Um, influence operations have had outside of the areas that you've studied. And this is really just in general for the panel. Um, Carly and Christian and Cynthia and Lynn and Chantel and John and Mike asked about you know, how, what is the reach of, of, of uh, the Chinese Communist Party into other uh, countries and, and regions such as Africa. There was a lot of interest in Africa in the questions. And related to that is what effect is the COVID crisis going to have on China's ability to conduct influence operations effectively in these uh, in these other regions, so I, I think I'll just open that up uh, broadly for the panel and see who'd like to take that on first. I can talk a little bit about regionalization and reach. Um, one of the things that we see with the state media apparatus on Facebook is that uh, Facebook does provide an avenue to reach audiences in other countries without necessarily needing to establish independent media on the ground in those countries. And that's an interesting tool that you know, was previously unavailable. And so what we see from state media is we do see the establishment of these channels um, on Facebook, either regionalized or uh, put into local languages or uh, occasionally what we've seen from Russia is actually the franchising uh, of operations to locals where it will be, they will fund a local television station and the operation will, you know, the, the media page will look like a local media operation carried out on Facebook when in reality there's some financial backing or some sort of uh, gray relationship there. Uh, so this, the kind of international, the presence of a large international standing audience has really transformed the ability to reach people with this kind of content in other regions of the world very easily. The question of what kind of impact it has, you know, that's a little bit more varied. That really does depend on them creating persuasive, compelling content. And our best measurement for that is looking at the engagement on the pages, but that's not always um, a, an accurate measure of how influential it actually is. I would just add that in the traditional media space, the Xinhua News Agency has been very good at competing with both Reuters and AFP in Africa and in Latin America as well to provide content to traditional media in that space. And they're very good. And the content is highly subsidized. So it's all, it, on, on several cases, it's provided for free, but it's often provided at a subsidized price. So they've been very successful at grabbing market share from, from both Reuters and AFP in, in those regions where they used to dominate. I would add, too, there's a tendency in the United States, I think, to assume that a lot of English language content is oriented towards us. And in fact, that's not always the case. Very often, the English language content is, is oriented towards other English language speaking countries, particularly in the global south. So, for example, India, Pakistan, parts of Southeast Asia and Africa as well. And so there, the, the framing is a little bit different um, very often, and they would be addressing issues that may not resonate closely with the United States, but doing it in English in order to target, say, Africa. And so, for example, when there were the charges of racism in Guangzhou with respect to Africans, 
um, China's you know, media image suffered greatly, and there was a very strong media push to try to get out in front of that uh, messaging, but they handled it very poorly because the Chinese media apparatus is centrally controlled. It is a very poor job of crisis management um, in the near term uh, because it has to sort of spin up the entire um, top to bottom management apparatus. And consequently, it handled that story very poorly and China's image suffered tremendously. So just to pick up on that, there are also questions about, okay, what can we do about it? How do we counter this kind of a campaign? Uh, there, there are some suggestions that, that, uh, that, that maybe there's an option for the United States to be more uh, offensive in terms of bypassing the Great Firewall and trying to get information to the, to the Chinese people. Uh, are, are there opportunities, for example, in Africa, where it, it's, there, is more, there are more and more reports of, of China overplaying its hand and, and opposition growing you know, from Nigeria uh, to Kenya into what some are describing as kind of a new form of, of colonialism associated with, with the debt trap and, and, uh, and, and, and Chinese infrastructure projects that in debt countries. Um, Joshua, Chris, Christian, Thomas are, are interested also in, in what, makes, what information already makes it into China. You addressed this a little bit, John, but, but what is the assessment to which the, Ch the, the Great Firewall is effective uh, and, and, and what gets around it? You know, what, what do the Chinese people really get, especially from Chinese language uh, media originating in Taiwan, for example? So uh, if, if someone would like to, to step in first on that and uh, that series of questions, what can we do to counter it? Uh, is there an offensive option? Are there ways to be more competitive to pick up on Glenn's point uh, in other regions? Uh, I, I'll jump in a little bit about the uh, success or failure of Western media to get into China. Um, effectively, in China, you sort of have two systems, if you will. You have the system that's, that's the, the access given to Western ideas, Western media, on the front of, you know, in terms of perspective of, of the, the average citizen, and then Chinese if, intellectuals, if you will. And intellectuals in China occupy a very interesting space where they're, because of their research and science often, they're given almost untrammeled access to Western ideas and Western, Western media, Western publications, et cetera, because that will help to benefit the, their research into Ch and, and China's modernization. Uh, uh, but when it comes for the sort of the broad masses of the Chinese people, they're much more seriously and, and, and controlled. So, for example, in Beijing University and in Ch at Tsinghua University in China, the use of VPNs is basically tolerated by the universities there. Whereas for the broad masses of the people in China, the use of VPNs, which they could use to jump over the Chinese firewall, is not tolerated and in fact it's been outlawed. So you have kind of a, a sort of a, a, a system in China which is very, very hierarchical about who can access information. And as a result, the intellectuals in China, if you will, are very tightly controlled by, by the state. And so people used to say that the internet was going to set China free, but now we've come to the conclusion that the internet has actually been bolstered the power of the police to ensure the right thinking of the Chinese population. Yeah, a related question, I guess, is, is really what can we do to defend against it here in the United States? Uh, and, and there are some suggestions about, uh, some questions about the recent decisions for some of our social media to attribute uh, messages that go back directly to, to official Chinese sources, to take down state-based accounts. Amy and Graham were, 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 uh, were interested in those questions. What is, who on the panel has an assessment of, of the degree to which these recent decisions make a difference and, and what more we can do to, to defend ourselves against Chinese influence operations in the United States? And I'll just note that, uh, that, that actually, I'm gonna combine this with another question as quickly, because there are other questions that, that involve Chinese influence in the United States broadly. So it's really, what can we do about it in the United States, but also what is the nature of Chinese influence here in the United States? There are some questions about effect on U.S. media. Does the U.S. media self-censor self, uh, uh, self uh, because of Chinese business influences in the United States? What about Hollywood? What effect do the Confucius Institutes have? And I would just point our viewers to a study that Hoover published in late 2018 called Chinese Influence in American Interest, Promoting Constructive Vigilance. Uh, John, you, you were one of the, one of the members, uh, one of the, those who worked on that study. So really, I just open up to the panel generally, really two areas to, to comment on. What is the nature of Chinese influence in the United States? And what more 
can the United States do to defend ourselves uh, against Chinese influence, disinformation, and propaganda? Some of the work that uh, I can speak to the uh, the latter a little bit um, on the on the subject specifically of labeling. So one of the research projects that we did at SIO that Vanessa can comment on as well. She's one of the lead researchers on that paper. Uh, was specifically looking at the impact of the ads ecosystem that I was describing in the pages ecosystem and that architecture, which while it's not, again, as Glenn mentioned, uh, solely targeting the U.S., it is English language, but that does not mean U.S. targeted. In fact, the ads were run extremely broadly, including to Southeast Asia and Africa. Um, the interesting dynamic is that one of the challenges on social media today is that each platform has a separate labeling regime. And largely they look at something like FARA in the United States, right? Foreign Agent Registration Act to decide if something requires a label. Um, but if you make a video and put it up on YouTube, so Chinese state media has a YouTube presence, the video is labeled on YouTube. If you share that video to Twitter, the label disappears. And that's just a function of the user interface design. The flag is not embedded into the video. It is put as you know, part of the border around the video. And so when the video makes it to Twitter, if it's viewed on Twitter, uh, that alert, so to speak, is gone. Um, similarly, on Facebook, while if you received, you know, if you clicked to the page, you could see CGTN is affiliated with or paid for in whole or part by the Chinese government, uh, but you do not necessarily see that in the ad. So some of this was just like achieving a degree of continuity um, between the platforms that recognizing that a lot of the enforcement of the policies kind of falls in the gaps. Uh, so this is a thing that the platforms are aware of and are thinking about. And, you know, our team did weigh in on that policy and advocate for more kind of clearer and better labeling. It's always been, you know, there's always been kind of a, um, the reason we have Foreign Agent Registration Act in the U.S. is because there is this commitment to free exchange of ideas and the you know, belief that even state media presented in the U.S., as long as it was properly identified, was still part of the, you know, part of a political conversation that U.S. persons should be able to hear and access as opposed to censoring. And so now the question becomes, in the new broadcast ecosystem, how do we ensure that audiences are properly informed about who the message may be coming from without trying to censor it entirely? Great, great. And even more questions on this topic coming in. So, uh, panelists, any, any additional comments on how to counter Chinese influence here in the United States? What is the nature of the problem and, 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 how, and how, to, to, uh, how to counter it? Um, I'd like to add on, I think there's a lot of attention to the covert um, activity and a lot of worries about that. But as we've kind of seen, that's not, not even getting that much engagement. Um, so the impact of that could be, could be rather small. But um, the overt activity is really really present in the US as well. And you know, you have Chinese state media um, running page long ads that kind of look like an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and in LA Times. And um, I think that that's also an aspect that we um, should be looking at. Right, right. Um, also just to piggyback off of what my colleagues Renee and Vanessa were saying uh, in regards to the covert and um, you know, with the anticipation that the US might be a target. Um, when we looked into the Twitter data sets, um, both from the 2019 and 2020, um, a lot of the information was geared towards um, events that were, you know, where China was involved, such as Hong Kong, um, or, you know, if there was some piece in which the US could be, um, you know, part of the conversation, such as with the George Floyd protests, um, what we analyzed was that over um, media uh, posts on Facebook, such as Global Times, when they did reference the George Floyd protests, um, they were more in relation to the Hong Kong protests. And, you know, oh, look at how great the Hong Kong uh, police are in comparison to the U.S. So it is more geared towards um, China and Hong Kong and those interests than what we've seen so far, at least. And maybe just to add on to that, most of the covert activity that has been in the Twitter data sets was written in Chinese. So the audience isn't, you know, the average American on Twitter. 
Thanks, I think that goes to an essential point. I think a lot of this um, covert, overt information activity in the United States is bifurcated. Uh, that which is happening in a Chinese language space tends to be happening in platforms that are controlled in China, um, that are in a sense exported into the United States, that emigrates from China bring with them on their on their mobile phones, like WeChat, for example. And these are information bubbles that China can continue to control and project outward onto the world. And to the extent that it exports mobile handsets with some of these apps pre-installed on them, that also gives it a pathway into other information markets. And so what it's doing in the Chinese language space in particular in North America and in the West is actually much more successful, much more targeted and much more ethnographically solid than what it is doing in the English language spaces in those countries, where it tends to be more tone deaf, where it tends to be falling flat, not connecting with its audiences as much. And some of the incentives perhaps behind these, these information campaigns, I think are responsible for what Carly was pointing to in that they're sort of reflecting back on Hong Kong saying, oh, you see the Hong Kong protests are so good because the imperative there is again, to make China look good. Uh, and that's one fundamental distinction there between what's, what China's activities generally are, and as Rene was saying, what Russia's activities are. Well, you know, a lot of these questions about influence do go back to the, 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 the report that, that Hoover did, and there's a panel discussion that I, that I was privileged to host, so you can find it on the Hoover website, and you can find uh, the report on Chinese influence. There are questions about, about Chinese influence in the United States as, as well in other areas, such as in research institutions and in academia, the role of the Confucius Institutes, which is covered in part in the report I mentioned. But Glenn, you have a report coming out in two days on this very topic. Would you mind just letting the viewers know about that report and, and, the, uh, and the web event associated with it so they can rejoin uh, in two days? Sure. Um, I would point you to the Hoover Events webpage, which has a listing for the event and invite you to register on Thursday at 11 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, 2 p.m. Eastern. We'll be doing a webinar on a new major report that our project on China's global sharp power will be releasing that looks really deeply at the um, exploitation of the U.S. research enterprise, that is American universities and government national laboratories, by a subset of Chinese universities closely tied to the the Chinese military. Um, there's been an extensive over years set of what was originally framed as very open, sort of positive looking collaborations between US-based scientists and these Chinese-based scientists. Uh, but the US institutions appear not to have known exactly who they were dealing with. These are Chinese scientists who are deeply embedded in institutions that primary mission is to advance the defense industrial and research base of the People's Republic of China. Uh, and so this report unpacks a number of empirical examples of that, and then sort of gets into how we need to retool and rethink the way we approach risk in our research enterprise. Because uh, as we're discovering in a great many other spheres of engagement with China, the relationship has been deeply asymmetric. And uh, in some sense, the United States has been a little bit credulous or gullible. Uh, and China, to its credit, it has sensed the opportunity and taken advantage of it. Um, you know, we have invited them in, uh, opened the door to our pantry, and they've helped themselves. Hey, what I like, what I'd recommend that we do is we go in the same order at, for each of you as we started, and and I'm going to summarize these questions really quickly and ask you just to address whatever aspect of these remaining questions you can quickly with whatever final statement you want to make as well, because we're coming up on the end here, right? So, so again, a, a lot more questions about how well is China doing? Why are they doing so well? So Vanessa wants to know, is this part of, of China's coercive power that they have because, uh, because of their economic prowess? And really what, what makes these influence campaigns effective outside of, of, the, of the media and the platforms that, that, are, that are at the heart of this study? You know, and another question from Cornelia, you know, is, is there an ideological draw to this? You know, what is this, what is this new communist ideology? And is, is she able to cultivate this, this cult of personality well internally? Why is he able to do that? Or can, is he, how, how well is he doing that? Uh, and, and externally as well. Some comments, Renee, that are kind of right up your alley there, which is, you know, what are the goals of this campaign vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia? And what does it agree to which Russia and China and others, maybe even like North Korea, are cooperating in these kind of efforts. And this is really Renee, David, Bruce, Amy are interested in, in, in that aspect of, of it uh, of, uh, as well. But 
I'm sorry I couldn't get to everybody's questions, but I think what we'll do is just go right down the line with Glenn and, and fire away quickly, and then we'll conclude. Thank you, HR. Um, what is the draw? Well, Xi Jinping came to power um, very possessed with a single question. This was right after the Arab Spring. It, how do I hang on to the monopoly of power that the Chinese Communist Party has, has achieved? How do we avoid what befell the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union? And so he has been focused on tightening discipline within China to avert that disaster and make sure that the Chinese Communist Party always comes out on top. Now, there was a brief honeymoon. China was the new kid on the block. It came out big. It was saying all the things people wanted to hear. It had money to spend. Spend. And so there was a period of a number of years where people were giving it an ear. I think that honeymoon is now over. China has to more of an extent shown its true colors. It's made promises it's not delivered on. And so I think people are coming to understand that China is not what they might have thought it was. Uh, and now there's more resistance. We're building resilience in our institutions. And there's more of a uh, conversation about how the US and other Western countries need to get back in the game, need to begin competing again. Uh, and I think that's the key takeaway here. We're smarter now. We've done a lot of learning and now we're gearing up. I would just add to what Glenn said very eloquently and thank you HR for bringing all these questions down to several. Uh, is the deeply unreciprocal nature of the relationship between China and the Western world, and that China has been able to leverage the freedoms in the West, as, as Glenn said, the pantry door has been open, and use the Western social media, media at landscape, the ability to open newspapers and TV stations in our country, while at the same time keeping its media landscape very closed tightly to any Western investment or Western influence. And I think that unreciprocal relationship is really fundamental to China's goals in pushing its narrative around the world. I would add that that's been um, interesting to us as well, particularly in the context of how to handle the overt state media pages on Western platforms that are inaccessible within the, you know, within the country. So a desire to uh, push out narratives to the rest of the world while remaining closed so that uh, people in China cannot see the, the content on Facebook, the similar pushback. To answer the question about um, goals of the campaign and cooperation, we don't see cooperation between state actors at the moment, uh, it, not, not China and Russia anyway, in, the, in this particular regard on the covert front. Uh, the social media accounts are quite distinctly different. They're run very differently. But where we do see some interesting amplification is in the overt space or the maybe grayer overt space. We've seen things like RT has a number of subsidiaries that make videos. They're targeted at young millennials, particularly uh, politically aligned on the left. Um, they put up interesting videos about the chaos of the Hong Kong protests. Uh, we see, again, similarly, um, state media will amplify each other's conspiracy theories if they are anti-US conspiracy theories and they will frame them as uh, some people are saying. And so we see this in the form of uh, some people are insinuating that the U.S. created COVID-19 at Fort Detrick and brought it over to China. That's what's being reported. So that narrative was making its way through the Chinese media ecosystem. Uh, China actually attributed it to its own kind of, uh, you know, kind of internet underbelly originally before its own diplomats began to kind of pick it up and launder it up the chain and make it a, 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 a widespread uh, public commentary that was that was put out uh, on Twitter so that U.S. audiences could see it as well. So we see a little bit of that that narrative amplification, uh, but that again is coming through more of the media channels as opposed to the subversive social media accounts. Thank you, and then we'll go Carly and Vanessa. But we'll have the last word. Thank you, Renee. Thank you so much, HR, for hosting this. Um, I think one takeaway that I'd like to leave everyone with is the question that you uh, asked, which is, you know, impact and um, setting disinformation. That's a really difficult question for us. Um, you know, did this influence campaign um, cause someone to vote differently is something that we don't have evidence for. Um, and one one point that I didn't get to mention in the Taiwan case study was that um, there was activity on uh, Facebook um, that was uh, taken down, but that was primarily domestic. Um, so when we're looking at these influence campaigns and talking about, um, you know, foreign interference, like that is not the only uh, voice, you know, um, muddying the water, so to speak. It's also coming from 
uh, domestic voices, um, unattributable voices. So question of impact is really difficult and um, important to um, keep in mind. Thanks, Carly. Vanessa. Yeah, just one add on comment on the impact. So it's really hard to see, you know, what specifically has changed um, someone's mind or not. Um, one, one kind of um, facet was that they've, they've done um, some studies in Serbia to look at, you know, perceptions of um, who's aiding Serbia in the coronavirus pandemic. And actually most of the help, most of the aid is coming from the EU um, and other institutions. Um, but the perception of the public is that China is actually helping the most. So there's, at least in some places, some of this um, narrative laundering it seems to be showing some effect. And um, one last comment I wanted to say is that as we're gearing up to the election, there seems to be a lot of worry um, on China's goals and, and what, what they might do. And I think it's just really important to re redraw that distinction between Russia is that China is really focused on making itself look good. and um, all the topic areas that we've seen are somehow related to China and they're not engaged in topics that have no kind of um, touch point with, with other um, Chinese interests. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope everyone will, co will go to the Hoover website to look for even more material on, uh, on China's sharp power. Thank you SIO team for joining us for this. What a, what a great event. Uh, Glenn and Renee, thanks for your leadership and pulling it together and, and putting together such a talented team on an important topic. And as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, just in time, I think for us to do something about it and, and especially uh, to, to improve our awareness of, of this whole problem set. So thanks to everyone. Have, have, a great, have a great day. Stay well, everybody. Thank you, HR.